So today I would like to, before entering into the talk, which is entitled, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, I would like to read for you the passage from Isaiah that is read for the first Sunday of Advent in year B. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. You, Lord, yourself are our Father. Our Redeemer is your ancient name. Why, Lord, leave us to stray from your ways and harden our hearts against fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your inheritance. Oh, that you would tear the heavens open and come down. At your presence the mountains would melt. No ear has heard, no eye has seen, any God but you act like this for those who trust him. You guide those who act with integrity and keep your ways in mind. You were angry when we were sinners. We had long been rebels against you. We were all unclean, all that integrity of ours like filthy clothing. We have all withered like leaves and our sins blew us away like the wind. No one invoked your name or roused himself to catch hold of you, for you hid your face from us and gave us up to the power of our sins. And yet, Lord, you are our Father, we the clay, you the potter, we are all the work of your hand. The central petition of this lament psalm from Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, is the title for today's talk. The invocation is particularly daring, especially in Old Testament times, where the people are reminded that no one can see the face of God and live. Isaiah's prayer is a lament, a crying out of how his people are suffering and seeking God to help them in a new and more direct way. Despite the extent of the people's suffering, in large part, of their own making, Isaiah has confidence that if God comes close, all will be well. This call upon the Lord to come among us could be taken as the refrain for the entire Advent season. The shattering of the separation of heaven from earth, the ripping open of the heavens, brings God close to us. The descent of God on earth brings God closer still. How we yearn for his closeness in these uncertain times when we have so many unanswered questions from this past year. Where has God been? Why have people suffered so much? What hope is there? Why have so many died? Why have so many become sick? Why have so many lost their livelihoods? Where is God in all this? The time of Advent, we are told, is a time of waiting and of expectation for the second coming of Christ at the end of time. The time of waiting is now already 2,000 years. Even the proverbially patient Job would be justified in becoming exasperated. The words of the scriptures and particularly those of the Psalms echo in our ears. How long, O Lord, must your people suffer? Indeed, the time of waiting is long. But each day it comes closer because the second coming of Christ is a universal event. It comes closer for every single one of us. The time in between is not a void, a period of absence in which we are left to our own devices. This interval is one where we are invited already here and now to prepare for the second coming. How might we prepare when we are assailed with our own questions perhaps more acute this year than in any other in recent memory. The scriptures of the Advent season don't provide neat answers to the searching questions that we have today. They do provide a broader context into which we might situate the questions and perhaps reframe them so as to direct us towards God's eternal gifts of love, 
life and happiness. The prophet Isaiah is often read in Advent, and especially the second part of Isaiah, which was written after the Jewish people, or while rather, the Jewish people were in captivity in Babylon. This second Isaiah, or Deutero Isaiah as some scholars call him, depicts a very hopeful future for the exiles. God will make a highway through the desert to bring them home. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. This text is made more familiar to us through the, the rendition in Handel's Messiah. Every valley shall be exalted. Every valley shall be exalted. And so on. The words take on a stronger significance when we consider the corrugated landscape that covers much of the distance between Babylon and Jerusalem, particularly the last section close to Jerusalem. The last 25 miles are all uphill and involve the negotiation of an incredible maze of jagged cliffs and deep valleys. When Isaiah speaks of building a new highway, he is really speaking of a complete transformation of the landscape. Isaiah recalls two major events of his people's history. First, he recalls the creation. With the return to Jerusalem, there will be a new creation. Secondly, he recalls the Exodus, the deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery and death in Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea and the entry into the Promised Land. The story of the Exodus is relived. Only now the exiles return from captivity in Babylon journey back through the desert and cross the Jordan River to enter into the Promised Land, which is created anew and where they will live in freedom and peace. This is a wonderful and encouraging prophecy for the exiles in Babylon to hear. When Cyrus, the Persian king, defeats the Babylonians and allows the Jews to return, this is understood by Isaiah as the Lord's work. God redeems his people through the agency of a foreign king. Many Jews return to Jerusalem and find that their land has been devastated, their city and temple destroyed. Although they have been allowed to come home, the former Babylonian overlords have been replaced by Persians. The Jewish kingdom is no more. The people are demoralized, and although they seek hope, the promise of Second Isaiah of a new creation and a new exodus ring hollow. Our questions today were very real questions for the Jewish exiles who returned from their captivity in Babylon to Jerusalem over 2,500 years ago. And indeed, the question of many intervening generations who have faced plagues, oppression, wars, recessions and injustice. Our questions are not new questions. The prophet Isaiah gives voice to the returned exiles' distress with which we might identify, particularly in these times. He laments the destruction. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our ancestors praised you, has been burned by fire, and all our beautiful places have become ruins. In ancient times, cities were understood as the hallmarks of civilization and the progress of humanity. God bequeaths the earth and all within it to humankind to use for its benefit that mankind be fruitful and multiply. The establishment of flourishing cities is a mark of humanity's fruitful use of the gifts of God's creation. The return of the formerly densely inhabited cities of Judea to a wilderness is a return to the original creation before humankind established a developed and ordered form of living. The story of humanity's cooperation with God has become undone. This is a severe setback for the people and for the hearers of the prophecy, the new creation and new exodus of which Second Isaiah speaks appear to be mirages. Isaiah in his lament speaks clearly of the destruction but also seeks to remind God of his ongoing relationship with humanity. 
the prophet addresses God in this moment of acute distress directly, you. He further recalls the relationship between his people and God, how our ancestors praised you. God has a long established relationship with the people, or more correctly, his people, a people who can, in times of prosperity as in the past, or in the current times of extreme distress, address God in a familiar I you manner. The relationship of God with Israel is often compared to that of a father and child, especially in the books of Exodus, Deuteronomy or Jeremiah. Isaiah goes further and indeed far beyond the other books or prophets of the Old Testament in how he addresses God. He repeatedly and directly addresses God as Father in this lament. You are our Father. You, O Lord, are our Father. Yet you, O Lord, are our Father. While we Christians are accustomed to calling God our Father in the Lord's Prayer, it is rare for God to be spoken of as Father in the Old Testament, and usually it is as a comparison. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Psalm 103. Never is God directly addressed as our Father, except here in this passage, and notably three times. Isaiah is emphasising the people's special relationship with their God in this lament by the repeated use of the term, Our Father. Some might object that Israel is often referred to as God's child, and so the notion of God's fatherhood is implied. Israel is collectively understood as God's son, both in the books of Exodus and Hosea. Israel is my firstborn. Let my son go, that he may worship me. And Hosea, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. God certainly reveals his closeness to Israel through the words spoken by Moses and Hosea and assumes the role of a loving parent. But there is a dis an important distinction with the prophecy of Isaiah, where the perspective changes. It is no longer God or the prophet on God's behalf who speaks. Isaiah speaks on his own behalf and on behalf of his people. In the book of Isaiah, the close relationship with God is affirmed not by God, but by us, his people. The situation is desperate for the exiles who have returned, and yet they put their hope in the Lord because he is their father. While God may have spoken of Israel in the past as his child, how might this late post-exilic prophet come to the realization that God is father? How does he dare suppose that we can call upon him directly as our father? What is the basis for this newfound presumption about such a close relationship with God? When examining this Isaiah psalm of lament, two further terms are used to describe God, quite close to the mentions of God as our Father. I will take the second case first. Yet you, O Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. God is here recognised as the one who made us. The imagery stretches back to the account of creation, where God fashioned humankind from the dust of the earth. Genesis 2.7 The same Hebrew root, Yatzar, is used for the fashioning of humanity and the fashioning of pottery. Synonymous terms are employed for the base material, namely dust of the earth and clay. While the material that forms us may be drawn from the earth, it takes its shape from the considered moulding of God's hands. Each of us bears the imprint of the divine fingers, an imprint which makes us recognisable to God as his own. There are two wonderful scup sculptures of God fashioning first Adam and then Eve at the creation over the north porch of the medieval Chartres Cathedral in France. Neither Adam nor Eve is complete and viewers behold God with his two hands, carefully caressing and moulding 
each into being. This indelible imprint reveals something of God to each of us. God forms each person in a unique way, and yet each has an affinity to the wider human family, and this family in turn has through the divine imprint of the moulding its collective affinity with God. There is much to be learned from contemplating how God has revealed himself in his creation, but especially how God has revealed himself in humanity. The pottery imagery is less suggestive of the procreative role of a father than the modelling of an infant, which is as widely regarded in the Old Testament, takes place in the mother's womb. The most extended reflection on this process is in Psalm 139. For it was you who formed my inmost being, knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you who wonderfully made me. How wonderful are your works, which my soul knows well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being fashioned in secret and moulded in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me yet unformed, and all days are recorded in your book, formed before one of them came into being. To me how precious your thoughts, O God, how great is the sum of them! If I count them, they are more than the sand. At the end I am beside you. God not only observes carefully the process of the modelling of the infant in the womb of the mother, but takes an active role. It is God who forms, who knits the infant into being, who had the form of the infant in mind, even before it came to be. God is wholly involved in the process, but both paternal and maternal imagery abound. God is metaphorically both father and mother of every human person. This is perhaps the insight of Rembrandt, who in his painting of the return of the prodigal son depicts the father embracing the son in his bosom. For those who might miss the maternal nuance of the posture, Rembrandt depicts the father with a male and a female hand, both resting on the back of the prodigal son, comforting him. The light in the painting shines most prominently on the father's downward compassionate gaze towards the son and on the two hands on the son's back, drawing the viewer, along with the son, into the father's embrace and bosom. Through the work of the father's hands, which moulds us in the womb, we bear the imprint of God's own hands. We are therefore recognisable to the one who formed us, and so we can with confidence address God as our Father. The historical context of the return of the exiles is pretty bleak. They live among a heap of ruins. The prophet interprets this situation where shortly before the mention of God as our father and potter, he confesses his sins and the sins of the nation as observed in the wayward behaviour of Israel. We have all become like one who is in unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. The current desperate situation is linked with the sin of the people. The prophet contrasts the hand of God which brought us into being with our hand, which we have used for evil. However, our hand is fashioned to collaborate in God's creation. Formed in the image and likeness of God, our hands and their action should reflect God's hand and action. The hand of God is a metaphor for divine intervention and a manifestation of divine power, usually resulting in a salvific action our behaviour is sadly out of sync with this. The life from God's hand has become lifeless through our hands. The fresh green leaves, symbolising divine eternal life, are exchanged for dry and wizened leaves, carried away in the breeze and sullied in the autumn slush, symbolising the sorry state of the people, which motivates our cry to our Father. The first double mention of God as our Father comes towards the beginning of the lament. 
for you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. The situation of the people is fairly desperate. So much so that their forebearers, Abraham and Jacob, would not even recognize them. They have strayed far from the Lord and understand themselves as even beyond the promises God made to Abraham or the covenant God made with Israel. The people are back in the land of their forebears and in the holy city Jerusalem, but it is a heap of ruins and they are at the mercy of a foreign power. The nation is at its lowest ebb. While the prophet acknowledges this sad state of affairs, he dares to call God our Father. Even if everything has gone wrong, even if we have excluded ourselves from God's promises, we can still call God our Father. The people make this personal address to the Lord with hope, because the Lord is our Redeemer from of old. The relationship with God has been ongoing for many years. Yes, it may have faltered due to our negligence, but God has revealed himself through history, through our own human history, as the one who delivers us from situations of suffering and death. The redeeming action, much like the fashioning of the potter at creation, is done by the action of God's mighty hand and outstretched arm. God promises Moses that he will redeem the Israelites from the burdens of the Egyptians and from slavery with his outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. Exodus 6.6 6. This is the first in a long series of such mentions. Later, when reflecting back on the Exodus event in Deuteronomy, God is now very often qualified by specific attributes. Not primarily his greatness or majesty, but how he has manifested his power on behalf of us, his people. God is forevermore not a distant God, but one who has come close in our lowest moments. When Solomon prays in the temple, he speaks of how all nations will come to recognize the saving action of God's hand and outstretched arm, and how they too will access this saving power through prayer. In short, God has a long history of saving his people from oppression, slavery and death, so much so that God is known for the saving action of his hand. The prophet Isaiah makes petition to God with confidence that he will be heard by the God who has proved faithful even to unfaithful Israel. Isaiah shows even more daring and calls God our Father presuming an even more intimate relationship. The sculptures of Adam and Eve are only part finished at Chartres and show that God's work with humankind is ongoing. There is the original fashioning of creation, but the ongoing refashioning of redemption or new creation. The hands of God are constantly and lovingly stretched out to his people. We have recoiled and gone our own way with disastrous consequences, but the hands of God are open and stretched out to embrace us as we return to him, much as the father of the two sons, depicted by Rembrandt in his painting of the return of the prodigal. The prophet takes quite a risk in this lament. To enter into the presence of the Lord can be dangerous, those who approach in the wrong way are often severely punished in the Old Testament. The prophet dares to summon God to come upon the earth. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. The prophet is aware of the impact of the Lord's coming, the quivering even of the solid mountains. The tearing open of the heavens makes a breach in the barrier separating the realm of God, the heavens, and humanity, the earth. The coming of God into the world will bring about a transformation, since all that is not compatible with God's presence, evil, sin, and death will be destroyed. Since Isaiah understands that God, who is our creator, our potter, and redeemer, is also our father, 
he now dares in hope to summon God. This prayer of the prophet is made in hope for a future day, and at the beginning of Advent, we also look forward to that future day when the Lord will come at the end of time. The cry of the prophet was certainly in the mind of the evangelist Mark when he recorded the account of Jesus' baptism. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens ripped open and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. The agent of the tearing apart of the heavens is not mentioned, but the passive is probably a divine passive, pointing to the action of God, particularly as the heavens are the realm of God. The prophet's prayer is in part answered. The heavens are ripped open. However, the prophet also appeals to, com to God to come down. The heavenly voice claims acclaims Jesus as my son, the beloved. The one who speaks identifies himself as the heavenly father of Jesus. It is not the father who descends, but the Holy Spirit who enters into Jesus. We no longer rely on a prophet to call upon God for help. It is with Jesus, his beloved child, invested with God's Holy Spirit, that we can with confidence call upon God as our father. The prayer of the prophet Isaiah is answered in a surprising way. God doesn't come down and visit us momentarily, but comes to us definitively in his Son and Holy Spirit. Originally in Eden, God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. God always intended to be close to his people. After the fall, Adam and Eve were banished from the garden and humanity has been apart from God on earth. Now, however, God in Jesus has come among his people. God has fashioned his own son in the womb and has redeemed him from death. The destiny of humankind is forever transformed by the coming of Jesus into the world. God is close by us once again. The prayer of Isaiah helps us to better understand the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, which Jesus taught us. God is addressed as Our Father, who manifests his love for us from our origins to our final destiny. While the Our Father speaks only of the male parent, we recognise from the metaphor of the potter the strong echoes of the formation of the infant in the mother's womb. No one metaphor is sufficient to speak of God's love and care for us. At the parental register, God is both father and mother to us. The connection to Isaiah's lament gives the Lord's Prayer an eschatological or end-time flavour. God is called upon to come among us. In the Lord's Prayer, the petitions, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, seek that God's rule be established in the world. We are not calling upon a stranger, but a loving parent who readily extends both hands to caress us and to enfold us in a warm embrace. Let us, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, come to recognise more the action of the divine hands in our lives. These are the hands that formed us in the womb. These are the hands that deliver us from the various trials in our lives. These are the hands that stretch out to hold and guide us every day. Let us accept that daily gift by praying the Our Father every day. The petitions of the, Our, of the Lord's Prayer have been answered for us in the first coming of Jesus Christ into the world some 2,000 years ago. In Christ, God's kingdom has come, God's will has been done, and we receive our daily bread, 
forgiveness of sins and deliverance from evil. There are, of course, trials and tribulations in this life, which will come to an end with the second or final coming of Christ, at which the kingdom will be fulfilled. The Lord's Prayer points us to this second coming. This first coming of Christ is the basis of our hope of his second coming in glory. Because God has already answered the prayer, O oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, we can with confidence make this prayer anew, that Christ may come at the end time, but also here and now in our lives. May we, during this Advent season, become attuned to Christ's action in our lives, to the careful moulding, to the outstretched hands that seek to guide us along our way, so that we may welcome him into our hearts this Christmas. Thank you for your attention. Rora,